We're going overtime, talking offensive line prospects for your San Francisco 49ers, two of the foremost experts in the 49ers media game, John Chapman and Brad Graham with me here to break it all down. Who the 49ers are going to take in the 2024 NFL draft right now? All right, gentlemen, John Chapman, 49ers Rush Podcast, Brad Graham, the SF Niners, joining me here on the new channel. Welcome to Overtime with Brian Peacock, OT with BP. Uh, no time constraints, no topic constraints. We go OT can stand for off topic. OT can stand for a lot. Let me know in the comments what you think OT stands for. OT with BP. And uh, I just sometimes there's time that uh, that I want to spend talking about something that doesn't really fit on my other podcasts. If you don't know me, Brian Peacock from Locked On 49ers, your daily podcast on the San Francisco 49ers on the Locked On Network. I also do Peacock and Williamson with former NFL Scott Matt Williamson daily on the entire NFL on the network. And uh, I'm sure you guys know John Chapman and Brad Graham. Appreciate you joining me, fellas. Uh, let's break down some O-line. Nobody you guys are handpicked. There's nobody I'd rather talk to than John Chapman and Brad Graham about offensive line prospects for the San Francisco 49ers. So welcome to the new channel. Well, this is awesome, man. And uh, anytime I can get more Peacock in my life, I'm a happy man. So uh, excited <laughs> to be here. And man, the legend. Dude, I got to say congratulations. We were talking a little bit off air. Uh, fear the beard, baby. Uh, just do it as thing, man. So uh, just an honor to be here with you two gentlemen. Dude, Brad Graham, and congratulations. You won the bracket. You beat my guy, Croc. By the way, the only person I've ever been beat in the old, uh, in, in the new, I guess I'd say, that we've had two seasons of this media bracket that uh, Stats Guerrero does. And uh, the only guy that's ever put me out is Crocker. But I've faced him so <laughs> early in the tournament both times, I haven't gotten out of the second round. Brad, though, took down Croc, who's never lost in the bracket, to win it. So congratulations, our media king, Brad Graham. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. I was honestly surprised to even make it that far let alone take down the former champ eric crocker i mean croc's been doing this thing in this space along with you two guys i mean it's cool to be able to share this platform with guys like croc guys like yourselves man who who've kind of like kind of been the trailblazers for guys like me you know i feel like you know i'm somewhat the new kid on the block out of us three so it's cool man and and you guys put in so much good work i'm just i think it speaks broader to the 49ers community and I mean you guys do tremendous work covering the 49ers and now we got Brian Peacock spinning off his own channel it, it's good to be a 49ers content creator right now let's go yeah I'm pumped for it uh, it's it's the the most well-covered team in the NFL content creators of all types uh, amazing Thanks. beat team guys doing video guys doing social guys doing pods uh, it's fantastic stuff and uh, some grinders, some film grinders out there, right? And and that's why uh, I brought you two guys on today to kick this thing off. And make sure everybody uh, subscribe. Uh, new channel, that, that's always the big important thing. Drop some comments in there on YouTube and make sure you hit that thumbs up and, uh, and subscribe. And I appreciate you all for that so, so much. And as we get into the offensive linemen in this, and, and this is a war room, let's hash this out because I think we all have different ideas of how the 49ers should play this thing. I think offensive line is still a huge need. Like they didn't do anything in free agency on the offensive side of the ball. Everything was on defense. They're bringing everybody back. So either they like the offense and don't want to touch it or what I think guys, and, and I don't know what you think on this and, you know, reading the tea leaves. Do you think the San Francisco 49ers are telling us, look, we did the free agency thing on defense. We're doing the draft thing on offense. I, it's weird because you look at even the draft last year. They didn't draft any old linemen. They they were like, oh, we didn't think any of the guys in the third round could make our roster. And then you go out there this year. Don't bring in another guy. It, it's it's weird how much confidence this front office and coaching staff has in the backups in the starting offensive line. It's the weirdest thing to me. And I do think that we have really good depth. The Niners have great depth, but they're lacking those elite guys. So I really hope. I really, really hope if there was any position that I wish they would invest in, be center and offensive tackle. And, you know, one of my favorite things, just listen to Brad always talk about these guys. I learned so much. So, like, I really hope you're right, Peacock, because we've got to get a tackle or a center or maybe even a guard. Like, you could use everything, especially with Trent, you know, getting long in the tooth, I should say. So, I hope you're right. 
Yeah, it's 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 now. I wish I could say that. I was just gonna say I wish I could say that I was surprised by this, you know, situation playing out. But I, I feel like I could see it from a mile away. They were going to keep Colton McKibbitt at right tackle. We knew he was under contract. The extension that he received, the one year, I think it was like seven million dollars, sixty five percent of that guaranteed, was kind of an indication like. You're going to have a chance to be the starter next year. It gives you a little bit of security, not a ton long-term, but enough to be like, you're going to have a shot to be the starter again. And they bring back Jonathan Feliciano, uh, which I do think was a good move. I I thought Feliciano uh, uh, overperformed based on expectation. And I really think the offensive line shored up when Feliciano entered the lineup. I, I I think Spencer Burford did struggle with consistency. But beyond that, I wish I was surprised that the 49ers, you know, weren't going to go out and make a splash in free agency. And I really do think that when we look towards the draft and we look at some of these prospects, this is one of the deepest offensive line classes we've seen in a while, uh, really. And you can find an impact uh, potential plug and play starter at the bottom end of the first. But the question becomes, are any of those guys going to surplant any of the current starters or do the 49ers feel comfortable to punt, go somewhere else? That's the question I think that we have to answer in regards to what the Niners are going to be doing uh, in this draft. Yeah, there's depth. Grab a couple of guys, you know, get a tackle early, get a center late if you want to. Uh, continuity is is important on the offensive line, though. So, you know, you have those guys coming back and let's add competition, I think, is the way to look at it i think there's still a very good chance the 49ers do go offensive line in round one could they move up could they move down uh could they you know draft the best player available because one thing the 49ers do and i and i like the the concept of it this offseason is you could you could play a game tomorrow like you could go the morning of the draft you could feel the team both sides of the ball you got starters and now you're just adding competition to that and if you draft the tackle who beats out colton mckivitz good but you know you have a guy who can start already so that's where the 49ers are starting from so you can go best player available and you don't have to force necessarily offensive line or another position and we know how much the Niners like D linemen too so that might be BPA for for John Lynch there in round one but let's talk about round one first and and maybe not even the ideal pick and who we predict will go to the Niners at pick 31 or who we like at 31 let's dare to dream a little bit first guys who is your draft crush on the offensive line who is the one player that you would love to become a san francisco 49er whether he slides down to pick 31 or gets within range of a trade up for the 49ers uh john let's go to you first who's the guy for you on the offensive line that fits the 49ers the best if you're daring to dream a little bit i'm not going to take his guy because i know his guy and (laughs) it's also my guy but uh i reserve the right i'm gonna just i'm gonna pass the buck here (laughs) Uh, and, and there's nothing You're a legend, wrong with John. That. Now, having said this, I really want a right tackle, uh, and you know, somebody with versatility. And I think one of the players, probably the most fun player for me, or at least one of them, is Fuaga out of Oregon State. But I think J.C. Latham out of Alabama. Th- that's the guy for me that I'm like, mm. I-, I could see him falling a little bit more than some of the other guys. And I have those five guys. I have five first round grades at tackle, and it's the same five that everybody's talking about. Um, but JC Latham, I just think was made for a Shanahan offense. I I really, really do, which I know there's the Alabama disconnect and all that stuff between the past, but Saban's gone. And I really just think plugging in JC Latham at that right tackle spot, instantaneous upgrade for the 49ers. And you could even move Colton McKivitz inside a little bit, but JC Latham just seems to make a lot of sense for a possible trade up. I doubt that he makes it all the way down to 31, but he is a fun, fun player. Yeah. JC Latham is a beast and he is like wide at the ankles. He's wide everywhere. It's crazy. He can blow people off the ball with his size. He's got the requisite length to play tackle. He says he's a left tackle could even, you know, start it right and, and end up on the left side. A la Joe Staley back in the day for the 49ers. Cause that's the ultimate plan. Like if I could build a prospect for the 49ers in this draft, it's day one starter at right tackle who could potentially play left tackle once. And, you know, it, it, it will be a bummer the day that, Right. The Trent Williams moves on, but you you know what's going to happen. And age matters. He's 21. You know, he's going to be 21 at the start of the season. So mm-hmm. you're talking about somebody that ideally, you, you brought up Joe Staley. 
let's get somebody that's going to be there for 10 plus years. You know, the McGlinchey thing, I think it was really smart that they moved on. I'm glad that he got paid what he did. Always love to see people get paid. Yeah, glad to see that he didn't get paid that here. But <laughs> exactly. Latham's the guy that gives you that versatility. You know, like you said, right tackle, shift him over. I think he fits. He's a damn fun player. All right. I'm glad you didn't take my guy either, Chapman. Oh, but JC Latham. I was trying to dodge. I was trying to dodge. A good one. Uh, Brad, who's your guy? Who's your <laughs> Who's your draft crush for the 49ers in round one? Well, you guys, it sounds like you guys already know. And we might even – it sounds like we're all in the same category too in, in that regard. But quickly on Latham, um, to me, he's impressed me the most in regards to just overall power in this class. I mean, it feels like that's a guy he gets his hands on you. There's like a 80% chance you're on the turf on your back floundering like a turtle. Like he is just so powerful. And whether in pass protection or in the run game, I've seen him making blocks 20, 30 yards downfield, shoving guys out of bounds. Um, he's a really quality player. And I also see a ton of upside if they were to kick him in a guard, too. Like, he could be a powerhouse at guard as well as tackle. So he does bring a ton of versatility. And sticking on the kind of versatility train, it's one of the reasons why, for me, Troy Fautanu, not only is my favorite offensive lineman in this class, he's my favorite prospect in this class. And I think – you know, John was alluding to it. I, I even think for you, Brian, I think you talked about Troy as well. Um, Troy's a dog, man. Like you, you can say all these different, you know, scouting buzzwords, but I feel like there are two things you can say about guys. They're a football player and they're a dog. And it just simplifies like what it means to be able to be someone who can make an impact in the NFL. I mean, we can go throughout the traits. I mean, he's 90th percentile in 40 time, vertical, broad jump. His 10 yard split is pretty impressive as well. Um, he does have a, a size element. I think he's like, what is he, 17th percentile in overall height. But for me, um, as someone who was an undersized offensive lineman, I'm not afraid of undersized offensive linemen if they know how to play and they know how to win their way. And when you watch Troy Fautanu on tape, you talk about feet, base, leverage, hands, technique, power, nastiness, everything that you want in an offensive lineman, I feel like is in Troy Fautanu. Now, uh, John made a great point about the age with Latham, who's 21. Troy is a little bit older. He's about 23 and a half. So you lose a little bit of that, that age, but you also get a plug and play guy. Like this is a guy you want on your starting lineup day one. Um, so for me, Troy Fautanu, man, I, I had so much fun because I was at the combine in Indianapolis and before the workout started for the offensive line, I'm just kind of looking through the guys and seeing which guy stood out to me from a physical build standpoint. I'm like, oh, there's Troy Fautano. He looks really just put together, like compact. He looks like an athlete. Threw on the tape, and I was like, oh, this guy's going to destroy the combine. And sure enough, you see his agility. You see his footwork. All that stuff is going to translate to the next level. So I think when it's all said and done, Troy Fautanu could be the best offensive lineman to come out of the, this class. Like that, that's how high I am on that guy. Question okay. real quick, Brad. I'm I'm sorry. Do you yeah. think that he's just a zone guy at tackle? Do you think that like power schemes and the pin and pull and all that stuff, do you think that they'll still have him graded at a tackle? Because I struggle with, all right, my Niners hats on because I think he's mm -hmm. an ideal zone tackle, like picture perfect, of course. a little short, but I, I don't know. I was curious what your thoughts are. Like, does he fit every scheme? To me, in my opinion, he does, because if you're running counter Trey, this dude is going to be pulling like a madman up the hole. Um, if you need to dig out defensive ends or defensive tackles, he can do that, too, because first step quickness, get off hand placement and leverage and then the power behind it. That's why I'm not worried about the size like lace up like Latham monster like you you look at like gap scheme he's like oh yeah you're you're dreaming of getting a guy like latham and gap scheme but i also think one of the positives that troy brings is that versatility and the 49ers run kind of like a hybrid outside zone gap scheme offense so he can do both and I, i'm really not that the size doesn't bother me in fact you know what's the saying in football right low man wins 
he's he's already won that battle. <laughs> and when you think about it, he knows how to manage longer defensive ends. Um, he, to me, is is pretty advanced in regards to the technical aspect of it. And when I think of power concepts of just being able to move a man from point A to point B, you can do that with technique and speed. Um, and he has the power to go along with it. So I see a guy who – that's why, to me, um, I, I've always, I'm always looking for the versatile offensive lineman. And so, for me, he checks every single box uh, along the way. Yeah, Fotano's too that, you know, the true five position offensive lineman could, I can see him playing anywhere, but I think he's a tackle and I like him better at tackle mm-hmm. than guard because he's not necessarily too. a blow you so back type of, a, type of a guard. 100%. And talk about his height, the height might not be that much of a problem because his length is still okay. He's got over 34 inch arms. You don't see the length really being a problem and it actually can help in some ways with leverage because he still does have the the arm length and the athleticism to play uh, out on the edge with with speedier rushers so to be honest with you he's one of the guys that i thought i was going to say oh he's going to be a guard all day uh I, I might like him at center more than guard too but i like him at tackle most of all and i think he's one of those guys you have to try a tackle and prove that he fails because he's too short before you move him inside my yeah. guy and i thought i thought john i thought you're going to take fuaga from me fuaga is my guy because plug and play right tackle day one easy shanahan's gonna love the way he run blocks and erases people there he's athletic to get out on the move he fits any scheme his arms are a little bit shorter and you know he did have a little bit of trouble at times with guys like uh leo tulatu because he's so good with his hands and so you see it a little bit on tape with the lack of arm length but at pick 31 Zero problems there. Now that's why he might slip a little bit. Which I, why th- when you're talking about daring to dream, I think you could dare to dream that Fuaga could be in within range of maybe trading up to get him. I know there's been some heat with him at like pick ten with the Jets. I think that's a little too high for Fuaga. I, I, there's going to be some teams that think he's maybe a guard because of that length, uh, just like Faltanu. So I'm interested to see where Faltanu and um, and Fuaga end up falling in the draft because I think there is an opportunity for them to get at least within range of the 49ers. I don't know if the Niners can get up there and get those guys, but and I don't know if Fuaga is a, you know, a future left tackle or anything either, and he did play right tackle at Oregon State, so I, I, I think some teams are going to say, okay, well, he's right tackle only. Maybe he's a guard, so maybe he's not a fit for us because we want the left tackle, that, which is why I think he could get down the board a little bit. Um, but all fantastic fits for the 49ers, all three of those guys we mentioned, though, Fuaga, Faltanu, and J.C. Latham, very unlikely to be there for the 49ers at pick 31, right? So let's be honest with ourselves. If the Niners yeah. don't go up and get a guy, this is where the conversation gets very difficult. And I think this is where we all will have three more different answers. The Niners are taking an offensive lineman at 31, guys. John, will go back to you. What's your prediction? Who is it? Who is the guy for the 49ers specifically at 31? We'll talk about some later guys. So you can't hedge and say, oh, we got to trade back into the second round. Then five picks later, I like this guy. 31, you're sticking and picking. Which offensive lineman fits for you there, John? If I'm putting on my Kyle Shanahan hat, which I I don't know if I'm smart enough to do that, I think Graham (laughs) Barton makes the most sense at that 31 spot as far as like, where they fit big board wise. I have a second round grade on them, but like if I'm looking at my big board, like I've got them picked 26 overall. So the values there that the neighborhood is correct and he kind of fits everything. You know, he played center a few years ago, so that's there. And I would draft him as a center. That's what I would want him to play. Now, I feel like Chris Forster probably wants him to learn guard. That's been the, the, what he does first with these guys that are moving. And so Feliciato, I feel like, is ironed in as a starter. You compete with Aaron Banks. Aaron Banks should be the guy, but Aaron Banks pre-entry and post-entry, that's two different players. If he bounces back, cool. You shift him into center. One does not simply beat Jake Brindle. Uh, <laughs> sadly, I have to say that. Uh, Cassius Marsh reference. Cassius Marsh, yeah. There we we brought that up on Locked On 49ers. <laughs> it was like... You sure about that? It's the, you know, the, I think you should leave me. You sure about that? And so that's, that's where I'm at with, with these offensive linemen with the 49ers this year. It's like, okay, they're going to say something like that in the draft, especially if they don't take one uh, in round one. 
but the, these guys can be beat out. I do think it's center, though, too. You're right. They would have to start somewhere else, and they've only been veteran centers in the entire Kyle Shanahan reign because yeah. they're making the calls. So even if they do draft a center, I wouldn't expect that guy to start week one necessarily. No, and, you know, real quick, just on Grant Barton, he's about as smart as they get. I mean, you know, he's been academic all ACC, not once, not twice, but three times. He's got center experience. He can do those things. And probably one of the most athletic interior offensive linemen, which is where I grade him, um, to come out of the draft in almost a decade. Like, the guy has it. Now, my yeah. biggest flaw with this tape was I liked his first and second quarter way more than his third and fourth quarter every game I did. And so that's something that is interesting to me with, you know, these lighter athletic guys like – I don't know. First quarter tape, way better than fourth quarter tape consistently. So that's something that I think I would want to figure out the strength and condition I think could help that out. But he's a damn good player. And, you know, five starts at center uh, whenever he was a freshman. So he's got it. I, I Brian Bulaga with versatility is kind of my how I try to pigeonhole him. If that makes sense. Well, he's but, a uh, maniac, John. That's why he can't hang on in the fourth quarter. He's on the ground every play. Cause either he's going to pancake you or he's going to get pancaked. He's like tripping over guys, falling over. Himself. It makes he's sense. Everywhere. Man, He's doing up downs the whole he's, damn game. Yeah, He's a maniac. He's got to kind of chill out a little bit. And there's a, like a lack of power element. Like I think he's more of a day two physical athlete, but he's such an ass kicker. And the film is so fun. He might sneak into sneak into round one, but he's one of the guys where I would, I would rather take him in round two and hope that he plays up rather than expecting something, expecting a tackle, expecting something. Because if you start talking about a guard or a center, you got to be a pretty special guy to be selected in round one. And everyone loves the tape because he's fun to watch. But that's where I would pause, and that's where I 100% agree with you. And I love hearing you say that you think he's a center. And real quick, just on that, I have 24 first-round grades in this draft so far. Like, I've got 24. You're picking 31. You're getting a second-round player. It's a first-round pick. Yeah. You get a second round guy unless somebody falls, but I, I I don't know. Do you do you have second round grade on him? Like, is that about where you see him too, Brad? Or do you think like this is a top twenty player in your opinion, in Grant Bark? I wouldn't say he's top twenty. I think because you're having, I agree with your assessment. I think he's going to be a center, and we've already seen that at his pro day. They're already kicking him down into center and wanting to see those drills. Just because, although we talk about size with Troy, I feel like you can see the size difference with Graham. And although Graham has phenomenal technique, even as a left tackle, when you are dealing with those longer, bigger power defensive ends, that can become an issue. Whereas if you're running outside zone, he is the perfect center to be able to cut off backside linebackers, to be able to get to safeties on deep outside zones. Like, he is a quality, quality zone uh, center, in my opinion. Um, but I kind of have him in the back end of the first. I can definitely see him going in the first. Uh, if he goes in the second, I could see that too based on the the transition that he'll have to make. But I think John did a great job of explaining like how smart this guy is. Yeah, I got to talk to him at the combine, and you can feel that. Like You can feel like this guy's very confident in himself. He, he's played so much ball. He knows exactly what he's got to do to improve his game. And no shirt at the pro are, day. That was awesome. That's what now, I'm, I'm saying. totally in on that one. Man. I'm down on that. <laughs> and then when you when you get a guy who's so technically advanced, that translates to other positions, and it makes it easier to pick up the technique of playing center or guard. So I don't think it's going to be an issue. I actually have. This might be a little bit of controversial to take right now, uh -oh. but I kind of like Graham Barton over uh, Powers Johnson. Like when I look at Powers Johnson, I see Ooh. the power. That dude is uh, literally a stone wall when it comes to be and dig guys out. But I look for a very specific archetype, and this is the Brad cap, not the Kyle Shanahan cap. Um, if it were up to me, my whole offensive line would be hybrid Troy Fautanus. And so for me, Barton fits that as a center. Like I look at him kind of like, what was the name of the the guy that the um, the Patriots took in the first round? Cole Strange, I think Cole it was, Cole. out of Chattanooga. I would say he's this he's way better off than than Cole Strange. And Cole Strange went, I think, 29, 29th overall. Um, I think the he's Niners, a much better. I was one of the 49ers Trey Lance picks, by the way. Ended up with the Patriots oh, and Cole Strange. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, interesting. That's yeah. a nice little parallel right there. Um, but uh, I, I like Graham. I like the technical aspect. I'm not afraid of the size, and I like the fit at center. So um, I kind of have him in that bottom first round range. So who's your guy then, Brad? Well, if I had to pick, I would say right here for me, it's that's a, how it's we all point. feel, by the way. <laughs> but it was it, a good point, John. It's like you're getting a second round guy. So, you know, and, and Cole Strange is actually a good comp because he's kind of what I explained with, with Graham Barton is you you don't necessarily want to draft a guy who has to be everything you hope he is to be worthy of the first round pick. You want to draft him on day two, and then he performs like a first round pick. And that's how I feel get the about the value and the upside out of Barton. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Absolutely. who's your guy at 31 then? So it'd be a coin flip between Jordan Morgan and uh, Kingsley Suamataia right now. But I, I admittedly have done more work on Jordan Morgan. So it, it's a challenge because Kingsley is can play both left and right. And I think that will be a seamless transition. Jordan Morgan has been predominantly a left. And I think he's done pretty damn well at left. I mean, when I put on the tape of him against uh, Latu coming out of UCLA, he he dominated him. And they also had Gabriel Murphy, who's projected to be third, fourth round defensive end as well. They had they weren't doing anything against Jordan Morgan. You could see now he's not super smooth in his pass set. You could see that there's some refinement needed in his base, but I would say he has the baseline traits that you want to tackle. His biggest knock is going to be arm length, but also in regards to how I've seen him handle that on tape, he does a pretty good job. He's got a mean chop. When you get those long arms with those defensive ends, he's just he's instantly chopping it. So that's one way to counteract shorter arms. I would say the the biggest thing that would that would come up is in the run game when you're trying to lock out a guy um, or they're trying to lock you out. Um, but outside of that, I think he can overcome the short arms. I would probably go Jordan Morgan right now, just based on what I think he is and could continue to be. I would say Kingsley might have the higher upside, but I would say right now, Jordan feels like he could be plug and play, uh, at left tackle. We'll see if he can make that transition to right. As we all know, that is not an easy transition if you haven't done it before. Um, but I do like Jordan Morgan. I like what he's shown on tape. I think he shows baseline starting ability at 31. He would be a guy that I would be happier if the 49ers could trade back into the second, maybe gain a little bit more capital, try to get him in the early second, that way to get even more value with that pick. Because again, there's no guarantee he's going to start right away. There's no guarantee that flipping him to right is going to beat out Colton McKivitz, who understands this offense, understands exactly everything that's required. And you got a guy flipping sides and gets six padded practices before, hey, it's preseason week one. Good luck, pal. Um, so essentially, I would go Jordan Morgan right now at 31. But even questions still still remain at 31. See, and, and this is exactly what they're doing in the room, right? Yeah, like, yeah this is 100%. Like, ah, wood, yeah. Wood. They're going through these draft meetings right now. And, you know, that sort of analysis from Brad Graham is why he defeated Eric Crocker in the media bracket, <laughs> uh, I want to point out. And uh, <laughs> thank for showing up. I appreciate you, Croc. Like and subscribe to uh to Shout the out Croc. 49ers legend TV out here, man. Channel. Uh, There's only legend status Catching here. Catching strays out there. Show up in the comments. <laughs> Uh, so I had a feeling you were going to select Jordan Morgan, Brad, you know, following your stuff and, and hearing you talk about these guys. And he's so much more plug and play. And he's another really versatile guy. I can see playing a lot of positions. And, you know, the short he's a he was an odd watch for me because Morgan just was easy, but he he almost bored me. And I, I don't know if I'm like holding it too much against him, where it's like nothing popped. And I was like, I, I want to see more pop from my first round offensive line pick, pick especially shorter arms, if he's going to move inside. And so I, I'm not convinced he can stick at tackle, which is why the other guy you mentioned, Suamata Ia, is my guy. And uh, and granted, he's he's boomer bust, but mm -hmm. based on the you know based on who the players I think will be. For sure, there at pick 31, I think Suamata Ia will be there. 
Uh, I could see him going 31, 32. I could see him going to the Chiefs, you know, again, early second round. He's kind of that type of a prospect. He's he's for sure a top 50 guy. Does he get into the top 32 picks? I don't know. But because he because I'm convinced he can stick at tackle, even though he's got more work to do than Barton, he's got more work to do than, you know, everybody we've mentioned here. I, I, you know, he's got the arm length, he's got the size, he's got the athleticism. Apparently, he ran GPS tracked him at 21.5 miles per hour. And I might have seen the rep that he did that on. I think it was a quarterback run Damn. at BYU. He is absolutely booking down the field. I was shocked seeing him run down the field. He was a five star recruit at Oregon where his cousin went, Penne Sewell, uh, ended up at BYU, want to be closer to family. And he's he was a, a redshirt sophomore coming out. So, Played his entire career, you know, 20 years old or younger. He just turned 21. He's going to be one of the younger players in the draft, but he still has starting experience for a full season at right tackle and left tackle. I think he sticks at tackle, but does have a fallback that he could play guard. He's got that big bubble butt that you want. He's a, He's got that powerful frame, big hands, long arms. He's just a pup. More development will be needed. He might not start week one, but I think his – his physicality and you know he does have experience and there's enough good tape that he could potentially beat out Colton McKivitz early in his rookie year and I think he would be potentially a guy who could be a starter long term at right tackle and even maybe even left tackle after a few years and by the way if you put his athletic testing side by side with his cousin Penny Sewell it's nearly identical and if and if it's not identical Suamataia has him by just a little bit height He's a freak. weight arm he length is. Uh, his 40 time is a little bit better. They both put up 30 and 31 bench press reps. Like he's got that raw talent and tools and strength. So uh, I'm swinging for the fences on Suo Mata Ia. And he's kind of like my last option I like for the 49ers at 31. You know what I mean? It's like he's 31 out of 31 on my board. I, you know, you, you you hope that one of the other players maybe slips down that you like, whether it's an offensive lineman or someone, somebody else. But for the reason of the guy who I believe has the highest upside and can stick at tackle, even though he's got more work to do than some of the other prospects, is not a finished product at all. Uh, Chris Furster, do your work. Uh, Suamata E is my guy at three. Yeah, the funny thing is we're talking about you know Kingsley and Jordan Morgan. In my notes on Kingsley, I wrote exact opposite of Jordan Morgan when it comes to pa <laughs> patience and pass pro. Like yeah. Jordan Morgan, like you said, chill. He's just calm, cool. You'll come to me eventually. Yeah. I'll get you. It don't I'll matter. Learn. I'll and win Kingsley's every like rep. But always leaning and always punching. And so it's funny because you're getting kind of two opposites whenever it comes to pass pro, both highly effective. But, yeah, it's a fun conversation. It's definitely a pick your poison. And when you, you look at Kingsley on tape, man, like the traits pop out. Like you see it. Like you alluded to the speed element that he brings. I mean, his feet, his base, like his ability to, to drop his anchor uh, when needed. Um, he can do it. But as we know, playing offensive line isn't about being biggest, fastest, strongest always. It's about who's more the most technically sound, who's going to have the most success at the next level because – if we're thinking about it objectively, every player in the NFL is biggest, fastest, strongest. And then right. on top of that, who's the smartest? Who's the most technically advanced? Who has the biggest bag of pass rushing tricks? And how do you manage that as an offensive lineman? And that's where Kingsley needs to develop his game. So, and I think it, it comes back to the question, kind of John alluded to it a little bit. It's like, I guarantee you they're arguing in that war room is it worth taking a Jordan Morgan or a Kingsley here at 31? Or do we go defensive tackle? <laughs> do we go defensive end? Do we go cornerback? Because I don't know. I feel like, and this might be straying the conversation off course a little bit, and I'll let you bring it back, uh, Brian. But um, it just kind of feels like to me, it's like each one of those guys has a a bit of a question to them that the upside's there to be the uh, starter in this league, in my opinion, but they each have questions and are the 49ers looking for questions at 31 or are they looking for a plug and play answer? And I think that's where this draft conversation is fascinating. And, and may I just say, I'm just happy that we get to talk over, about a potential first round draft pick. For the first oh time my god years. this draft season is in so much fun you got a first round <laughs> pick got a second round pick i don't know what to do with all these uh all this tape i get to watch of actually uh you know high-end prospects potentially for the 49ers here one player john i was surprised i thought i, I had a feeling brad was going to take jordan morgan i thought you might pick a different center john 
uh, Zach Frazier from West Virginia as your guy at 31. I know you I like freaking love him, man. I, 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 my problem is I like him more than everybody else, and I feel like Barton fits what the Niners do better. But I think, personally, Zach Frazier, I love him. I have a second-round grade on him. I, him and Harris, him and Graham Barton are back-to-back in my rankings, right? But if I could do one thing for CMC, like we always talk about offensive line for Brock Purdy. Let's see what he could do. If I could give CMC one pick, it would be Zach Frazier. Th- that point. is just a match made in heaven. Like immediately you're talking 800 yards rushing for CMC. If you just agree to draft, draft Zach Frazier and just let him play week one through CMC would be the biggest beneficiary of that. Now Zach Frazier has his issues. Okay. He's not crystal clear, but you watch him in the run game. That's crystal clear. That is consistent. And that is three years of tape, not just 2023. There's zero. You don't need any, futuristic vision to understand what Zach Frazier can do for this offense immediately. Um, in my opinion, and I know I'm higher on him than most, but gosh, man, he's just fun. And I love the movement that he gets 20, you know, two and a half thousand snaps at center. The guy's been through it. He's healthy all the freaking time. Um, you, you know, I understand he got injured the very last game, but then he shows up the combine and still competes with an injury. Like, I don't know. I I love this dude, and I hate West Virginia football, but I love this dude. <laughs> Croc asked in the chat uh, if Brad has touched on Darius Robinson yet. We're not talking defensive linemen. We're talking strictly offensive linemen today, but it, it's a good question because, you know, maybe at the end we'll we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some, uh, some other players we like at 31 if they don't go O-line. Spoiler alert, I have. <laughs> <laughs> he's a beast. Darius Robinson is a, is, is an absolute beast and certainly in play for the 49ers. Well, th- I mean, that's perfect. So let's say the Niners go another position, D line corner, whatever in round one, let's talk pick 63 guys. Is, is there a player you guys like on day two, maybe even a deeper sleeper in this class uh, further on down the road, maybe on, on day three for the 49ers, John second yeah. round sleeper. We'd like, I'm going to go Michigan, which I, I, again, I'm not a Michigan guy. Uh, Mike Sanders still, you know, if we're looking at Niners biggest needs, I think the slot nickel corner role is at the top of the list. And so I love this dude. Uh, you know, CEO is his nickname, ball skills galore. He's got the experience. He's one of the only few guys that has played nickel at the college level with a lot of experience that could transition to that. A lot of these corners were like, oh, he could play nickel. He could play nickel. This guy's played nickel. Um, and so like, I would really like that. I think again, if I'm looking at immediate plug and play, who's going to help this team the most, that's one of those guys. If he lasts that long, I would absolutely love cornerback Mike Sandra still his tapes fun. He's just fun. Your player. Guy. Well, if he's your guy in round two, he's probably not going to be there in round three. So that means you got to go O line in round one. If that's your, if that's your player. And I, it, it, that's the problem because I don't think this draft fits that unless you go center. I don't see it at tackle. Jordan Morgan, all right, cool. But, like, if I'm looking at the best players for a one, two, three, man, even in the third round, like, the tackles in the third round, like, there is defensive tackle depth, edge depth. There's all that. And so whenever I do all these stupid mock drafts that we always do and I enjoy them, every single time I look back and I'm like, man, I did not help the offensive line the way I wanted to. Right, and you, you don't love who falls at, at – like if you don't go O-line, you almost are forced to move up again just to make sure you get one of the second-round guys you like, right? Is, is there a guy you like at 63 for on the, on the O-line? On the O-line, yeah. I think there's there's a few guys that are around there uh, if they do fall. You know, Patrick Paul, uh, Blake Fisher, Roger Rosengartner is another guy that just keeps – the more I watch him, the more I like him. And I watch him because I'm watching so much Fontenu tape, and I'm like, oh, this dude over there moves freaking well. And my player comp for Roger Rosengartner is Joe Staley. Hey, dude's one of the I, most athletic, <laughs> moving – like he looks I, like a tight end. So I, I wrote that down. I started watching Rosengarten. I looked at his, you know, his athletic testing at the combine was really, you know, great. He was sub sub five zero in in the forty yard dash, and I started watching more of him. I was like, oh, is, is, is this the guy for the 49ers? He ran four nine two six five three zero eight. Roger Rosengarten out of Washington. He moves like, oh, as good as any tackle in this draft. Poor man's not- Joe Staley. Is this our guy? Second round pick. You can bypass offensive line in round one. Go somewhere else. Maybe that's the plan. And I kind of went the other way. The more I watched him, 
I was like, oh, gosh, you know, I was hoping for poor man's Joe Staley. Didn't quite see that. Not as nasty. And he 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 shows athleticism, but he also like just loses way too many blocks, even when he gets his body in the right spot with his athleticism. He got um absolutely wrecked on the inside. And, and I, apparently the title game against Michigan was his worst game. It was the first game I put on, which is why maybe I had a, a different outlook from the start on Rosengarten. Um, Rosengarten. Yeah. And at times he looks well-schooled and he'll get out, you know, on a block, but he didn't win enough for me. And I got a little bit more worried and I was like, yeah, I, I might even like him in round three more than round two. But like, that's the problem with offensive linemen in the third round or second round. Like it's, it's yeah, buts. That in all of them, like, and you can go through all of them and just be like, yeah, but yeah, but if you want a clean guy, you've got to spend, and you're probably not going to get him at 31. Like, you've we're back to where we started, yeah, you got to move up, and that's the problem. So, do you just stay there and get three good players in first, second, third round, and possibility none of them are old linemen, and then you got to have your stupid press conference afterwards and say, we didn't think any of the guys could compete with the guys we had again, and everybody's pissed off. <laughs> Like, right. We're we're right we're right there we're like I'm just saying that's a possibility yeah and the board the board is it, when you're at 31 the board's gonna dictate what you do if you're smart and, and I don't want the 49ers to force it yeah. at, at one position either Brad do you like a guy in the second round yeah but to, to John's point it's I'm over here laughing maniacally because this is how I viewed this whole draft after I've gotten into the prospects at 31 again there's no guarantee that any of these offensive linemen are starting it week one, maybe, you know, due to an injury or throughout some maturity and development. But it's like, I could totally see the 49ers just punting and going with a defensive tackle, replace Eric Armstead, go with a cornerback. Like we were talking about the guy that John talked about in the second round could definitely be an option. Um, I have cornerback too, kind of circled in the second, third round as well. Uh, because, you know, you have the Amador Lenore, so you have the flexibility to either go outside corner or go nickel. And you could kind of play Diamador wherever you – I, you know, I asked Diamador straight up. I'm like, where do you prefer playing? He was like – he said, man, if, if they would have played me at nickel in the Super Bowl, that would have been a different game. So it's like he's willing to, I think, play outside or inside, which gives them the flexibility – to go out. And I think there's some underrated corners in this class. So that you could probably push that down. Who knows? Maybe they go Kool-Aid McKinstry, you know, one of the big names um, in this list at 31. But to, again, to John's point, it's like, man, I guarantee you they're looking at this draft more holistically than I think fans are, because I think we all agree. We would love to see the best possible offensive line out there. I'm an offensive. I'm super biased towards the offensive line. I know you guys watch the tape and you want offensive line as well. But it's like, what are they thinking? What What do they want? What do they? We think got the some 49ers broken uh, breaking news. Uh, oh. Just came across from Adam Schefter. Um, oh, here we go. I, I hope that's okay, Brian. Sorry. Yeah. Forty uh, ers just signed Green Bay Packers running back Patrick Taylor Jr. to a one year deal. Um, special teams, whatever. But hey, okay. we didn't get the tight end. Hey, Brock Wright's we, not the guy. Well, there you go. Uh, as is brought up in the chat, I know Peacock would love another third round running back. <laughs> All right, we can take that third round running back off the board because they've <laughs> added another guy in free agency. Yeah, I wonder how the new kickoff rule is going to impact the 49ers. Seems like they've gone pretty heavy, which they have in the past as well, in free agency to shore up the, the special teams and some of the coverage units. And uh, it, Ray Ray McLeod's gone. So, uh, you know, don't that's kind of a dark horse thing for the 49ers to address a a return man position with a wide receiver corner uh, running back day three fine you know but uh so so that's another interesting need that you know doesn't get talked about a lot because it's not a quote-unquote starting type of a player but uh, the return game i think the 49ers are gonna pay some close attention to here uh, as we go through april um you mentioned a name john patrick paul that's the guy I love in round two if they don't go tackle. And again, the, just like round one with Kingsley Suamataia for me, you know, I'm just I'm swinging for the fences on a tr guy who's going to be a tackle in the NFL and hoping the traits win out and you can coach him up and he's a starting caliber guy, at least at right tackle in the NFL. And that's what Patrick Paul is to me. And he is huge. 
he bear hugs guys and he's going to get flagged out the wazoo if he doesn't get that hand usage cleaned up and get it inside. But man, he can move around a little bit for how big he is. Six, seven, three thirty. He can move. He's played he has the lot. longest arms ever. He started more games than all these guys at offensive yep. tackle, which scares you because of how you still raw, even though you've played so much like you yeah. see Morgan who's smooth and coached up and Feltano yeah. smooth and coached up. And then Patrick Paul, you're like, well, why are you so raw looking even though you've started for three years? So that worries me a little bit, but we're, we're talking about a second round guy instead of a first round guy. And if you have to, if you're telling me, would you rather take Tyler Guyton at 31 or Patrick Paul at 63? It's not even close. I like, I might oh. like Patrick Paul better than Tyler Guyton. I don't know if Guyton's necessarily a fit. I don't know how you guys feel about Guyton. Is there any like non fits for you with the 49ers in this draft? My biggest non fit is Marius Mims. Um, Ooh. I'm about as out on that player as possible. And a lot of it is just because I watch game tape and his game tape is good. If you're watching the first and second drive, you start watching a game tape and you get to the third drive and you're like, what happened to this guy? He's not on the field anymore. All right, cool. I'll go to the next one. First, second drive. He's out there. Third drive. He's not out there again. Like then you get to the combine. He didn't even make it through his first 40. And so like, yeah. you're talking about somebody that like, okay, the tape is good. You can only watch eight games in three years. That's it. And so if you've ever been upset at Javon Kinlaw or a Ruben Foster pick, you sure as hell should be out on the Marius Mims thing. And I have a third round grade on them. I don't pull players from my board, but if I was a GM, I am literally making an executive decision. I'm throwing that name off the board. Like, I just want to stay away from it personally. I'm not spending a first round on that. I have a third round grade on him. He's a good player and whatever else. I'm out. That's just me. He's almost like a, a Trey Lance of offensive tackles, right? Where you're like, man, there's just, there's not enough information for me to make this high pick. But man, I love the prospect. And he yeah. looks good and he's got the traits. And I like Mims more than Guyton. I would rather have Mims than Guyton. But you're you're hoping you're crossing your fingers with that sort of a pick in Demarius Mims, and he's one of the guys that you kind of hope goes before the Niners pick, pushes down another guy. But if he's there at 31, I, I almost don't know how you can't make the swing because I, he's a he's got starting NFL tackle traits all day. Mims definitely scares me a little bit. I think the inexperience, and again, I'm hyper <clears throat> I'm hyper invested in the technical aspect. Like, I think I've made that pretty ad abundantly clear. And when you don't have the, the hours logged, especially what did he start six, six or eight games, something like that in his career. Um, so he doesn't have a ton of hours logged and he's already kind of a big lumbering type of guy. And that, that just doesn't look like what the 49ers are typically trying to go after. So, I could see a team absolutely falling in love with him and being like, yeah, we see the fit. We see how he can fit in our offensive line and we have the time to mold him and develop him and, and spend that time. He does kind of, he makes me nervous. He makes me nervous based on fit, uh, based on kind of if they are running outside zone, I don't know if he has the foot speed to be able to get out on those linebackers and those cornerbacks and be able to get up field. So that's, but you can see when he gets his hands on you, he can lock you out, and you're there's a good chance you're not getting by him. It's just the, the finer details, I think, of of the the technical aspects kind of scare me a little. De definitely in the first, I, I don't know if I would, I would be a little nervous with him in the first. One of the lowest zone blocking grades of any tackle that is draft eligible. Like, I get the you see it. He played 800 snaps in his career, like. Patrick Paul has like over 2000 more snaps than this kid. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I know I'm off on him, but no, that, that's okay. If you don't like a prospect, you don't believe it. You can't draft it and you can't put that, that first round grade on him. So no, I, I love that. Uh, any other sleepers, any other good fits you see out there for the 49ers? I want to ask you guys one more question about some non, uh, non offensive linemen here to finish this up. But any, any other notes you guys have on offensive linemen that you think are future 49ers? Oh, that last line, you kind of tailed oh. me off. You uh, like them, but the Niners won't? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say this. <laughs> Christian Jones, and in, in the I, I've been thinking, you know, my hamster's always sick and running slow upstairs. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're like, okay, if we first three rounds, you don't get a guy on the offensive line, like, what are you doing? I think Christian Jones, a, a guy out of Texas, that kind of fourth round 
you know, could be there, maybe move up in the fourth round, back in the third round. That's an offensive tackle that I think does fit really good in the run game. Um, you know, he kind of fits, got experience. He's older. There's some issues in this game for sure. I'm a Longhorn. I, I, trust me, I've cussed at the TV enough over this guy. But he's got a lot of traits that I think fit what the Niners do and will push him down. So, like, if the Niners do punt at the offensive line and take value at other – positions outside offensive line christian jones is a guy i could see day three that you could pull in and guard tackle versatility could play both those roles um that's one guy that kind of stands out to me you know, look we'll we'll gl we'll gloss over the fact that that was a homer pick by you john oh, but time. when big you time. look at his you know he's he's like jordan morgan on day three as far as like his physical profile from the combine i'm saying not you know not the tape at texas but christian jones at the combine six five uh, and a quarter, 305 pounds. He's got the requisite arm length, 30, 34 and a half inch arm length. He ran a four, uh, 5.04 40 yard dash, which is really good for a 300 pound man. Uh, he didn't do the uh, the agilities, I don't think. I did a shuttle 478, which is not fantastic. Um, but interesting prospect there. Checks and, a lot of boxes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something to work with for sure, especially if you're talking about a guy who you might not even have to draft on, on day two. Any last fits you like, Brett? Uh, a guy that I'm kind of zeroing in on still <clears throat> admittedly need to do some more homework on, but he's a smaller school prospect. Mason McCormick out of South Dakota State, 6'4", 309 pounds. I, I see him as a good fit at center in the NFL. Um, he's played left guard uh, a lot. He's played some center as well. But I love the testing and I love the physicality that I've seen on tape. From him so far he holds up as a pass blocker he's good in run blocking but i mean <clears throat> you look at some of this testing he's he ran a 5.0840 84th percentile his short shuttle to me 4.45 has him in the 94th percentile as a former offensive lineman i really like to look at the short shuttle because to me that really translates to pulling it really translates getting to second level. It's the being able to move laterally. You know, offensive line isn't just north south. Like you got to be able to hit angles. You got to get on tracks. You got to be able to move on an angle. So short shuttle for me, being able to test the 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 lateral aspect of their game is really big for me in translating to the next level. But I mean, 99th percentile in the vertical, 98th percentile in the broad, 94th percentile in bench. Uh, and, and you look at the 10 yard split, 1.71, 86 percentile. So we test extremely well. Um, and one of the things that stood out to me when talking to him at the combine was he's like, I had the opportunity to go play power five football. And he said, I didn't want to leave my guys. To me, loyalty was staying here at South Dakota and finishing this out with my boys. And that was more important to me than going to play big time power five football. And like, you know, the, the intangible things, I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Like, let's go. Like, I, I love that mentality. Um, and to me, he's a guy that I think fits best at center in the league. Um, but again, he can do it all. And if you can get him third, fourth round, that could be a guy that could challenge for a starting spot uh, with Brendel. Like, he would, I think he would push Brendel and, and really make it, you know, obviously, uh, assuming he translates from, you know, FCS to the NFL level re relatively quickly. But uh, assuming that happens, I would say he would be able to, to really challenge Brendel pretty quickly. And that would be um, very similar to what they did with the Fordham kid, right? It, it's hyper athletic, yeah. super smart, super loyal, small school. Like that, maybe that's what the Niners want to happen. And so it, when you say that, my freaking, I'm lighting up over here like, man, that's probably what they're thinking. Yeah, Brock Purdy might need a new roommate. Uh, unless he's actually he's married now. He's married now, so he he's probably moved in with his wife. Hey, and those sponsorship deals are coming through for him too. Yeah, absolutely. He got dude, his paycheck basically got doubled up by the uh the the rookie contract incentive, whatever it's called, program, 700 k So that that's solid for the for the Purdy family. Um you, you mentioned athleticism on the interior, and I love that strategy for the 49ers. Tackle in the first round. Whatever, if you get a, a a tackle early, come back in the fourth round and draft one of these center prospects, these guard center guys. Absolutely. And, uh, the uh, South Dakota State 
kid, uh, McCormick. I mean, I, I, it's a fantastic fit. Tanner Bordellini out of Wisconsin. I, I was so excited because he hit all of those. And the combine to me is more important for offensive linemen. I want to see the big men run. And it's more indicative of future NFL success than seeing the four twos from the wide receivers and the cornerbacks. And in some ways, the, the wide receivers in the corners who run the fastest are more likely to not succeed versus the offensive linemen who run the fastest are more likely to succeed. And Tanner Bordellini out of Wisconsin comes in at 6'4", 303. He's got big hands for a center, which you like. He's going to be handling the football. 494, 40-yard dash, a 169 split in the 10-yard split and an absurd 428 shuttle, 7163 cone. I mean, he just blew that up. And most guys with that athletic pro- profile – at 300 pounds, succeed in the NFL. You get him with a, a coaching staff. You get him a year in the weight room. He wasn't quite the ass kicker I hoped I'd see on film when I did put on the Wisconsin tape. But if we're talking about a fourth round guy with all that athleticism and ability, and who knows, maybe the combine pushed him into day two. I don't know. But I love the idea of going tackle early and then center in round four. How about and Niners met with them too? So like that fits. There you go. Oh, I mean, the athletic profile is there for that, you know, that wide zone offensive scheme you know one guy i can't figure out i don't know if you guys have watched the yale tape speaking of smart guys kieran amegaji uh, what do you do with this guy how do you even put him on your draft board i see him in the second round i can't touch a guy in the second round who has no workout numbers to even go by he's beaten up on guys who clearly are not going to be playing in the nfl at that level he didn't qu- just he, he wasn't like just burying guys into the turf either although he was winning easily on a lot of the reps i did see he, he was hurt so he wasn't at the all-star games you would love to see a guy like that compete at the senior bowl just to give you something to go on i I can't see touching that guy until at least round three but obviously he's got the traits to be a nfl tackle it's hard like i could find tape of kieran and be like yeah second round pick the problem is the medicals you know you had the torn quad um he struggled. He's been working with Willie Anderson. I was reading this fun article on him trying to get ready for the NFL. And I mean, he's played everywhere, left guard, left tackle. I don't know. Um, some of the best feet in this draft, some of the longest arms in this draft. There's lots of good. He's smart as hell. Obviously this, this one, I feel like teams are going to be second round and undraftable on this guy. Like every team <laughs> board's going to be crazy. But like you just can't put him on your board. Cause you don't know what to do with them. Not enough information or you're willing to, to swing. Yeah. Yeah. The upside's there though. I admittedly haven't done uh, the work on him. So I have to bow out of this conversation on him. Um, but he is a name that I have heard. And I think one of the things that, I've seen discussed about him are some of the physical tools and the traits that he brings to the table. Um, So uh, he's definitely a prospect on my list that I want to cross off, but I haven't got to him yet. That's the hard thing. When when you watch the tape, it's like, what what can you do with Yale tape anyway? You can't just finish the grade there. There's not enough else to go on. I will say this. If he's there in the second round when the Niners are picking, I think a conversation has to be had because he's such a good fit. You look at like run blocking grades, and I know it's against Yell and whatever else. The athleticism, the feet, you put in his measurables on mock draftable. It's Elijah Vera Tucker. Like he is a fit, the build, but with 30 intelligence arm thing. length, too, by the way. He's got some things. But again, the conversation should be had at 63 if he's there. I don't think he's going to be there. If I'm a young team that's swinging for the fences, and you could like put two years of waiting to learn with a guy. I think that that's kind of where he goes in the fifties, but for the Niners, ah, I wouldn't be mad if we got him though. I'll be honest with you. I'd take him over Mims. Nine four, I'll take it. I'd I mean, take him over Mims. I'd take Mims all day, but for the same reasons, I would be, I'd be afraid to draft both those guys, but I would be excited for what they could be at the same time. But for Omega G, I, I couldn't see it before the 49ers third round pick for me personally. Um, just not enough information. Okay. I got to let you guys out of here. Uh, I, I appreciate you jumping on so much. One last name. I want to hear from you guys. You don't go offensive line at 31. Who's the pick for the San Francisco 49ers at the end of round? Ooh, John, are you queued up? You ready to go? You got your list. I'll go together. Kool-Aid. I, I like, I like me some uh, black cherry. Yeah. Kool-Aid. It's a good Let's one. do it. <laughs> it's a good one. He, that's, he, a, he, that's a good one. He didn't work out like crazy. I think it, it would be smart for the 49ers to go corner with one of those first couple of picks. 
uh, and he could absolutely be best player available. Fits a need. I, I like that for for Kool Aid. And and when I talked earlier about Sua Mataia, you know, one of the guys I would be like, yeah, he's kind of worst case. You know, I would take Kool Aid first. You know, and so I like that one a lot. Brad he's is twenty four on my big board, so I'd be yeah. if that like, falls. I'd be he's happy. your he's your last first round grade then. Correct. Okay. Kool Aid is definitely an option for me as well. Uh, I think he has big time superstar traits. It's just pulling it together. And it was funny, I talked to his trainer at the combine and he basically said, it's like, it's just finding a, a place that he can fit into a system that can pull the, the, the talent out of him. And he, the guy that I was talking to has plenty of players on the 49ers and he was like, he would fit perfectly with Kyle. Kyle would be able to be able to manage that. So I think that would be a good pick. Um, there are there's one guy, and you know, Croc even touched on him, uh, Darius Robinson. I think he could definitely be a fit there with the 49ers to be able to play edge. He's kind of a big end. He, he doesn't have like that that speed burst that you that I've kind of been hunting for, but I could see the fit with the 49ers. But another name that I just came across, and and I whether due to my own ignorance or whatever, I I haven't really seen too many people talk about him. You guys may already know who he is. Um, but Rook Ororo is an extremely intriguing prospect based on his raw, his rawness, but almost lightweight, dare I say, elite athletic traits for an interior defensive tackle who used to be a basketball player to defensive end to defensive tackle can play in the zero can play in the three can play in the five and you're just like i'm looking at this guy and i'm like i i, I feel like no one's talking about him because no one can pronounce his name like yeah <laughs> because i start to get into the tape and i'm like oh like this guy you see the the measurables on paper but then you see it translate on tape and then i'm like i'm, I'm spinning like I'm like the 49ers need a a defensive tackle on the opposite side of Hargrave. Like I, I'm not I'm not a, a huge buyer into that Malik Collins and Jordan Elliott are an upgrade or serviceable in my opinion to replace Eric, but I think that's a guy who you could plug and play day one starter. And if that's how you view him, with a guy who has an arrow pointing up in regards to upside. Uh, being able to develop a bigger bag of pass rush moves and and those types of technical aspects, he's got the baseline traits and he's a force on the interior. And then if you can keep building and you put him in that scheme with uh, with Kosurik, I mean, who knows? I mean, I know Braden Fisk is a very popular name that's been creeping up the boards, but Rook is very I'm intriguing out. to me. I I need to do more work, yeah. but uh, he's very intriguing to me. I'm out on Braden Fisk, man. He just washed out the run. I think he's the uh, shortest arms of any defensive lineman at the combine, by the way. And uh, he's, he's a motor super, guy. He's super active, nonstop. Love the pass rush. I think he's a rotational player, though. So completely out for pick 31 for me. And you know, I I, I gave him a third round grade. So Same. Uh, I just I I don't see the ability against the run. If you can't stop the run, you can't play a full load of snaps at defensive tackle in the NFL. So, uh, but I love Johnny Newton at 31 from Illinois. Uh, he, mm -hmm. I think he hasn't had a chance to work out. So not a lot of people are talking about him sort of undersized three technique guy. Feels like he's uh, going to go higher than really high. Really everywhere. Some people have him like, this is the best defensive player in the draft. And some people have him like in the second round and he's not big. All the, all the, that's the, why he's like, not getting the media love is because he's not big. And he, awesome. and he hasn't worked out yet. So his, I think he's got a, I think he's got a special pro day. He's got some kind of injury that, that prevented him to work out the combine at least. So, so we'll see. But in, in, uh, they talk about Braden Fisk being an end. He's short arm. Like he's not an end. Oh, like Ruka Roro. No, he's in the so Ruka Roro is a good one. I've seen him more in the second round than the first round range, but he's, he's, you know, got traits. Um, I would love him in the second round for the 49ers. You mentioned Darius Robinson, who I love. I could absolutely see that being the pick. And then the 49ers have met with Brandon Dorless out of Oregon, who's that bigger end kind of undersized pass rushing tackle. Maybe that archetype is something the 49ers are looking at in this draft. So I could see any of those yeah. guys 
Uh, Those two guys make sense stack too because it's like Dorless and Robinson. You have your first first round option, your third fourth round option. So like if you don't get Robinson, Dorless is your all right third fourth round. We're gonna get that mold. Yeah, so they absolutely. they match. They're the just, other name I'll throw out there too is the opposite Robinson of Darius, and that's Chop Robinson, who's just dynamic. You know, uh, Chris Kosurik wants the GTFO, right? Uh, they get the, 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 the I could you know what this is my new channel I can curse on this channel if I want <laughs> you can do whatever you want I'm just quoting another guy get the fuck off right get off the line Let's and go. and Chop Robinson <laughs> has that more than any player in the draft he's a little undersized but he's yeah. actually he brings some toughness and he he brings a little bit of edge setting to him I don't you know he's got some work to do to to get home and and statistically it wasn't there for him but he's got all the ability to be dynamic player in that that mold that D Ford was for the 49ers defense. So, you know, chop Robinson, Darius Robinson, very different. I'd be okay going there and figuring out offensive line later. Um, But one of those guys I think could slip down to the Niners at 31 and they might not have to go to one of those, you know, I don't want to say dirtier prospects, but just one of the guys we like more in the second round than the first. Can they get one of those true first round grades at 31 or maybe move up a little bit? That'll be what's fascinating to me. I Trade would back, definitely man. prefer Chop over uh, Darius at Same. 31. The, the, the athletic the, traits are through the right. roof. All, all of my picks have been like, what? Let's let's bet on traits, especially in the first round. Let's let's yeah. go with the guy who can actually stick at tackle and has the highest upside there. Who's the the meanest pass rusher in the draft? Who has the upside to be a difference making player? That that's kind of where I lean on this, and I, I'm okay with teaching some of the technique to him once they get to the NFL level. Well, the Shadow 49ers draft has a long track record of uh, elite physical traits, and so uh, I, I, I concur, my friend. <laughs> yes, and look, everybody, make sure you subscribe to this channel because one of the reasons I wanted to have this channel was to be able to go live during the draft and be on for hours if we want to, and I'll have Brock. Go, go. Uh, I'll hopefully have Brad and John joining me all the time here doing these roundtables. Uh, this is really fun and uh, just kind of a loose environment here for me to to go over time, do do some things that that wouldn't make the Locked On 49ers channel. I'm talking talk a little Giants baseball as well. This that We could go any direction here. Talk, um, you know, I'm a former bartender. I like to make a cocktail. Do you guys have a favorite beverage you'll be drinking while you're watching the draft? Uh, lots of tequila, my friend. Oh, you just go straight. <laughs> By the way, I put the ice in there. Does that, that help? That flows at the 49ers Rush road trip events, by the way. It just go, yeah. it just comes, man. It just comes. <laughs> Brad, what um, is your choice during the draft? Well, I don't drink, so I, I can't partake, unfortunately. H2O. <laughs> H2O. Gatorade. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, honestly, I, I was just thinking about it, man. Like, this was hella fun because. How how often can you get three guys on on one call breaking down offensive line? Like you know, it really doesn't happen all that much, if ever. Like, and I think that the level of like nuanced offensive line talk that we brought today, I, good job, boys. Like, um, it was fun, dude. Like, you go, like, even if we don't agree on certain prospects, like the logic is there for yeah. why you believe what you believe, and I think that's. That's the biggest thing when it comes to this draft stuff, right? It's like we all have done this for a long time, and we're always going to look at different players, and we're going to see it different a different way. And they, we're not always going to see it the same way. And that's the beauty of this uh, imperfect process. And today, it was really fun, man, to hear guys' thoughts on it. And, and just, you know, I, I feel like sometimes, you know, I'm just talking offensive line to, to myself. And – uh it, it was fun to hop on here, man. You guys, you guys know what you're talking about. So it, yeah, it was, it's, I had a blast, man. The tennis match of the sports talk, man. I don't like talking to my own face in the in the, in the <laughs> screen. You know, I, like, I have I like bouncing ideas off of people and having fun and seeing where the conversation goes. And I can't thank you guys enough for joining me here on the very first live YouTube edition of OT with BP, man. Uh, let's do it again. I had so much fun, John. Tell the folks where they can find all of your stuff. Yeah, 49ers Rush, wherever you watch, listen, or click on things, uh, we'll be there. Brad, the SF Niners, tell the folks about it. Uh, you said it. You can find me on the SF Niners, any social platform. We'll be there covering the San Francisco 49ers. The number one media creator. Number one. Being podcaster. 
in the entire San Francisco 49ers market. <laughs> knock it Brad off. Graham. Make sure you're following John and Brad and subscribed up. Please subscribe here to the new channel so you know what's going on. And we'll be talking about all kinds of angles with the San Francisco 49ers draft and uh, maybe going off topic and going uh, all kinds of places here on Overtime with Brian Peacock. So appreciate you guys. Appreciate all the listeners out there. Make sure you're subscribed up and we'll be back with you next time.